testing. Uh, for the recording has started. We'll put everyone on okay. mute. If you want to speak, just uh, unmute yourself and the attendee list. Thank you, Betsy. Appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, again, this evening we are so happy to have Mr. David Lindo uh, uh, with So we're so happy to have Mr. David Lindo with us, uh, but we do have a few things that we want to mention beforehand and a couple of announcements. I know, first of all, I hope everybody is staying safe and practicing social distancing and wearing masks, but still getting out. Um, right now, it's a beautiful, beautiful evening here in Cleveland, weather-wise. Um, so we hope that people are getting out and again looking around what? their local patch, their neighborhood, and, and there you are, seeing what's, what's around. Uh, it's really, really uh, special to be able to do that. Uh, sometimes we forget about our own backyards. So glad to have everybody join us. Um, a couple of other quick things is um, we, uh, as far as our neighborhood sightings, I don't know if anybody's had anything special. Uh, I know I've had wild turkeys walking through the yard just about every day, and somebody else was mentioning the turkeys were walking down, what, Ridge Road, did you say? Yeah, so the turkeys have just kind of taken over our neighborhoods, which is, which is kind of interesting and fun. And, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's just it's just a really interesting thing. How about anybody else have some sightings from around your your backyard, your neighborhood? That's something that you may not have seen if you were you know out and about. You'll have to unmute yourself if you want to answer that. Anybody? Nancy, this is Catherine Clark um, in Parma, and we had a flock of ten. Um, uh, cedar wax wings land for about 15 minutes in our river birch tree and then they took off. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm Emmy, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my most recent one was uh, hearing a black-billed cuckoo and I had an eastern bluebird way up there at the top of that tree behind me. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I also do have to announce that oh, about a week ago, maybe a little bit longer, I'm sitting out in the backyard and I see this bird flying by that it, its flight just kind of attracted my attention. I said, I've never seen it flight like that. And it was a good sized bird, slightly bigger than a crow. I'm like, what is that? So I go and grab my binoculars, and then I grab my cell phone because now I've learned how to take a photo through the photo, the, the camera on my cell phone through binoculars. It turns out it was a Mississippi kite. Holy moly! Yeah, it landed on top of a tree. I, I, oh I got my some photos. I got some photos. I sent it to Craig Caldwell. So. Uh, hopefully they'll accept it as a sighting. I mean, I wrote everything out. It was, and but the photos aren't too bad, so you can at least tell it was something that wasn't a red-tailed hawk or a Cooper's hawk. So it was, it was awesome. So new yard bird for me, a Mississippi kite, which is not common up here in the north. I think they're they nest down in uh, uh, on a golf course down a little bit further south in Ohio, and of course further south. So. Again, just really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah. So I did want to mention that you know we have a couple of our our uh, staff people or our board members, uh, Karu Suboni, and he's back in Japan for a little while with her family, and we we extended our international oh, yeah. hand with through Cuyahoga, our international hand. And we uh, have I'll, uh, have, have uh, Karu as our international ambassador to Japan, and she was so thrilled to hear that we've extended our, our international realm. And she wrote back. Uh, she says, 
Wow, thank you for the courtesy invitation. And I'm honored to be a WCAS International Ambassador to Japan. I don't know how I can express my pleasure. In February of 2017, I was fascinated with birds in Cleveland and jumped into Spring Bird Walk. I still remember how excited and enjoyed the first bird birding like a young child in Rocky River Reservation. Well, I didn't know anyone out there. I didn't understand what I was listening to, didn't speak English at all, didn't have binoculars, and I didn't know how to use it even though a lady uh, lent me a pair. Also, I wasn't able to see the bird, uh, birds the leaders pointed out. I only saw some, but this first experience made me become into birding more. So much joy, like water is flowing into me. I appreciate you keeping, you keep encouraging me to live my life abroad and exploring uh, birding life. Hopefully, I can go back to Cleveland within a year, but until the time, I will write more about Japanese birds and preserving activities uh, in Japan, as well as share, sharing some uh, ideas, aspects, and culture as an ambassador. So she was totally thrilled. If you've never met Karu, uh, a delightful young lady, and uh, again, was really touched by the, the uh, warmth that we sent to her as, um, first of all, inviting her to be the ambassador, but also in, uh, in introducing her to birds. So I, I think we're, we're trying to be in the footsteps of David Lindo, introducing new people to birding. Um, All right, Michelle, are you on the line? I am here, Nancy. Excellent. So I think you have a couple of announcements, yes? I do, thank you. Um, so I, do, I want to announce that uh, in-person activities are still canceled and will be through June, and this includes our bird walks. Um, however, bird walk leaders are still going out when possible to collect bird survey data for eBird, so I want to extend a a really great thank you to them. That's a very important activity. Uh, Bill Dininger and Dave Grasskemper have been walking the Rocky River Nature Center trails for the canceled second Saturday bird walks um, this whole time, uh, I think April, May, and, and will also in June. Uh, this past second Saturday was May 9th. It was a cold day, about 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the cold must have been keeping the birds in hiding because only 38 species were reported. Uh, notable species were almost every woodpecker on our list, the red-bellied, downy, hairy, uh, pileated northern flicker. Um, also uh, spotted were a blue-headed vireo, viri, white-throated sparrow, eastern tohi, a northern water thrush, and two Nashville warblers. Uh, so that was, I mean, even though only two warblers were sighted, that was still pretty exciting for me. Um, so I would like to invite all of you to visit the Western Cuyahoga Audubon news blog at um, wcaudubon.org for published birdwalk reports. So the entire report will be on there, not just the, the few birds that I listed. Um, you can also look for reports in the newsletter that arrived in your inbox this morning. Um, so please uh, subscribe on our website, wcaudubon.org, if you haven't already done so, so you can stay current on our upcoming events and the bird walk reports. If you do decide to bird in small groups during the pandemic, uh, we just encourage you to follow social distancing um, guidelines, stay six feet apart from one another, limit your group size to 10 people or less, uh, travel separately from location to location, wear a face mask or face covering, um, wash your hands or use a high alcohol hand sanitizer. Um, so we want to stay safe as we enjoy the birds that we'd love to see. All right, and that's, that's all I got, Nancy. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Michelle. Yes, because we all want all of you to be able to go out and bird again and again and again. So we'd like to see you out yeah, there. Maybe, Thank you. Yeah, can I make a message, I, uh, an announcement? Um, who yeah. is this? This is Steve. Steve? Mm -hmm. um, um, as, as some people will know, the, um, the normal early May um, in-person plant sale of the Shaker uh, Nature Center at Shaker Lakes was obviously canceled. Um, and one of the features of that sale every year is what we call the homegrown sale. 
And um, I'm very pleased to announce that there will be a homegrown sale uh, next Thursday afternoon, next thir- the 10th, the 10th, I think that's Thursday, um, at uh, Shaker Lakes uh, with a lot of control of uh, ingress and uh, people will have to wear masks <coughs> in order to get in. We'll only allow a few people in at once, um, but there will probably be five or 600 um, beautiful homegrown plants, about uh, three quarters of them natives, Ohio natives. So, um, and of course it's for a very uh, good cause to support the Nature Center. So I'd like to invite you all to, uh, uh, from 2 p.m., 2, 2 to 7 p.m. next Thursday at the Shaker Lake Nature Center. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that announcement. Fabulous. Uh, Betsy, I think you have a, a couple of quick things you'd like to mention, yes? Yes, I do. Um, so I'd like to, there are so many people who have been contributing wonderful stories and photography to the to be published to the WCAS website. And we, of course, we share everything widely on social media. So I want to give a big shout out and thank you to everyone who's been doing that and encourage uh, everyone here to go to the website wcaudubon.org and go and check out the uh, story blog and the news blog. If you go to the home page, you'll see a lot of different navigational buttons and they'll take you to the different materials. Um, so thank you and please go and look at all that stuff. There's great stories all about spring birding and you'll be excited. Um, uh, also, um, please follow us on sh- social media. If you're on Facebook or Twitter, um, the best way that you can help our cause to promote the Audubon mission is to share our posts um, with the people who you connect with on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I also want to let you know that um, uh, that the next seven-day uh, bird-friendly coffee free shipping code will be active and available from June, the end of this month, June 29th, uh, for five for seven days, and then uh, finishes uh, July 5th. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to our email list because that's where all the great stuff comes out, and you'll get it right directly right into your email. And I'll be reminding you all the time. Uh, about the news stories, the news, and uh, when the next free coffee shipping code occurs. Uh, and by the way, you'll want to order your coffee directly at Birds and Beans uh, uh, website, not on ours, because for right now, and while the COVID restrictions are active, um, we're, we're asking people to order their coffee out of the Birds and Beans website. So again, make sure that you're subscribed for our email updates and we try to be really clear about communicating and um, give you the tips and information that you need. Uh, And the final thing is um, that this program is being recorded and uh, we can watch it as many times as we want, um, probably tomorrow. And I'll send an email out about that and where you can go to watch it again. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Stay safe, happy birding, and be well. Thanks so much, Betsy. Appreciate it. And Gloria, another one of our board members. Gloria, how are you this evening? Don't forget to unmute. Gloria? Gloria? Okay. Okay. I'm doing quite well, Nancy, and I thought I was really ready to go and I forgot to unmute myself. Anyway, I'm speaking on behalf of our Urban Birding Cleveland uh, group, and um, I wanted to be sure that we all knew the history of David and um, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. He came in November last year and helped us with our kickoff for our urban birding initiative. And from that, his instructive conversations, the bird walks that we all went on, um, the facilitated meetings that we had with Tom Romito, we began urban 
Birding Cleveland. And David is a founding member of WCS's Urban Birding Cleveland. So, um, thanks to Tremont, Ohio, we want to give them a special thanks because they stepped up to be our first urban birding community. We have been a little bit behind on what we wanted to do with face-to-face -face and bird walks and our trails because of COVID-19, but we're doing these things virtually. We're trying to stay in touch with everybody and we'll we'll be back we'll be back to being out in uh, nature with us all soon. I would ask all of you to go to wcaudubon.org and uh, subscribe to find out more about Urban Build Birding Cleveland. You'll see our UB Cleveland. You can click on that and you can click on that logo and you could go and explore what we've done, what we are planning to do, and uh, join us for Urban Birding Cleveland. Thank you. Wow, thanks so much, Gloria. And I think Gloria said it really well at the end, join us. Um, we always need more volunteers when we're doing some of our events. So keep an eye on our website. Uh, we do post some of the different volunteer things that we need to have done. And you know we're always trying to reach out and get our members and our guests um, a little bit more involved because it takes all of us. It takes, it takes our community. It takes the birders. It takes people who have, have different skills to, uh, to make uh, an organization run well. So we're just about ready to get into our program, but I want to mention that uh, on Tuesday, July 7th, uh, yeah. the first Tuesday of July at 7.30, we are going to have Isaac Robb from Western Reserve Land Conservancy, and he's going to be talking about uh, the importance of land reuse uh, in urban areas, places that may have been dumps. Um, are ter being turned into uh, green spaces, urban parks, and this is not just for wildlife, but for people as well. And, I, and, and so that should be a really, really interesting uh, program from the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Again, Tuesday, July 7th at 7.30. Uh, and this evening, gosh, uh, a gentleman that really needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyhow. Uh, Mr. David Lindo, uh, uh, urban birder. But you know what? We've got a, something special for, for Mr. Lindo. Um, you know, since we are going global, you know, we're Japan and now Spain, and we, we really would like to have uh, David be a uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon global ambassador. And uh, as a global ambassador, that would be a bridge between the world and WCAS birding communities. Um, they might share ornithological information, uh, human interest stories, uh, activities based on mutual curiosity, the love of birds, and a shared vision for a healthy, self-sustaining habitat. Um, so we, we hope that, uh, David, that you will accept as a uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, Global Ambassador. Again, we're reaching out to different parts of the world. So, how about that, David? Uh oh, hopefully they didn't fall asleep. Is David there? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, yes. Right, okay, let's start yes. again. Take two. <laughs> I'm totally and utterly um, honoured to, uh, to be asked to be, um, you know, an ambassador for, a global ambassador for WCAS. Um, since my first visit in November, I've felt a, an amazing connection with you guys. Um, I feel very close to you, part of my family, or I feel part of your family be more correct and I speak of uh, Cleveland 
and Ohio as much as I know Ohio by sitting at Cleveland um, all the time to all the people I speak to. So I'm very proud and I'll hopefully try and do my best to to serve you guys and get the message out there globally. Wonderful. That's so great. Well, uh, David is going to talk about urban birding basics. Um, he's going to have little sections and he said he would be happy to uh, have questions asked. Uh, and then we'll answer those questions with uh, between his little sections. Like the first section is, what is urban birding? Maybe for those of you who are just joining us, you've never heard of the term before. So, David, I'll let you take it over. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can I share the screen? That could be a question for Betsy, actually. Is it possible yes. for me to share? Hi, David. I'll be with you in just a second here. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> in the meantime, whilst the technical things have been done, um, thank you very much, guys, for allowing me to come uh, this after this evening for you, and this night for me. It's two o'clock in the morning now. Um, hang on, let me see if I can do all this. Um, yeah, thank you very much for. Uh, allowing me to come to see you today. Can you see what I'm seeing? You can see my... Yeah. Good. Okay, well thank you so much. Um, as you may have gathered, I'm actually in Spain and I've been in lockdown um, since the end of February. And it was pretty tough, to be honest. It's one of the toughest in the world in that we weren't even allowed to go and have exercise. So I spent around about 60 days in my apartment, um, maybe going to the store around the corner, which was literally five minutes walk, um, maybe once a week or maybe twice a week. And it's interesting because my apartment um, has three stories and I have a sun terrace. And when I got on the sun terrace every day to go and do a bit of birding and just to try and connect to nature, my vision, my vista, was just rooftops, um, satellite dishes, and um, chimneys. And that was it. Not a lick yeah. of green anywhere. Um, no. But despite that, I managed to see about 40 different species of bird. Most of them, in fact, yeah. There were 10 species of uh, raptor, which is good, and the rest were a few small birds that were living around me, as well as birds I saw fly over, maybe for a split second. And the best bird I had, actually, was, um, it's called a, a, a Eurasian stone curlew, and it's a shorebird, but it lives inland and um, in often harsh terrains, and they're nocturnal. And I heard it calling at night, which was fantastic. But what was fa what was fascinating was after two weeks, sorry, after 60 days of not being able to go out, when we were allowed to go out for, for an exercise for an hour a day, the first morning I remember getting up at six in the morning because I was so excited to be able to go for a walk and maybe do some birding. But I felt agoraphobic. I felt very nervous. Um, Cindy. The whole idea. Um, and basically, when I went out, um, I walked not for one hour, but for three and a half hours. And uh, during that time, I, um, my hips started seizing up and my Achilles. <laughs> it's funny, no one warned me that if you don't walk for 60 days, you're going to be using muscles you haven't used for a long time. And that was pretty hard. But anyway, that's my situation. I'm in Spain. I'm from London, that's where I'm from originally, and um, I'm here to talk to you about the basics of urban birding, and a lot of you already know the basics, so I'm maybe, as we say in England, teaching you how to suck eggs, but what I want to do is maybe there's a few bits and pieces around the main subject that you might know that you might not know, in terms of I might try and, well, I'm going to try and tell you stuff that you may not actually thought of before but the basics you may already know. So, 
just to explain who I am, um, I'm known as the um, Birda. I'm now the proud global ambassador for the WCAS. So that's another title that has to be put on social media very quickly. Um, I've been birding all my life, but as uh, as a professional, as the um, birder, for the last 15 years, um, I feel myself as a writer, broadcaster, um, I lead tours, I give talks or lectures, and I'm also, I suppose, consulting uh, when it comes to getting people to engage with nature. In fact, my whole strap line is basically out there, I'm out there to try and engage people living in urban areas with their environment and nature but through the medium of birds. So for me, it's actually more about people. It's more about getting people to understand that they are part of nature. Because as you well know, many of us are walking around with our blinkers on, you know, not looking up, not seeing anything, and not realizing that nature is actually all around us. And what's been, what's been fascinating for me has been this whole unfortunate pandemic um, in one way has, has, got, has led to people actually being connected to nature. They have noticed a lot of birds singing, for example, because they've been staying at home. And I know from certainly in Europe, I've been getting many calls and emails and contacts from, from the media saying, oh, there's lots of birds around, why is that? So it's interesting to, to then explain to them that actually that may not necessarily be more. It's just that you are hearing them because, you know, for once you're staying in one place and for once there's no background ambient noise, human hubbub, traffic and planes and trains. So you actually hear more. So I'm not sure if that was the case in Cleveland. I would imagine it was, but certainly that was the case, case in Britain and, and most of Europe. But the other fascinating thing was the fact that a lot of the birds were hearing more for the first time because obviously they, like us, were used to all the background human noise and when that stopped, they suddenly were hearing rivals in other territories that they didn't actually realise were there. So it kind of made them much more vibrant, louder, and, you know, saying to themselves, there's another male there, I have to really up my game. And even in Spain, when I came up to, I, every night I used to have my uh, mobile phone and leave it outside to try and tape nocturnal sounds. I didn't hear too much, apart from shutters occasionally. But in the morning, the dawn calls would start. And I remember getting up one morning, it was just about getting light. And there were maybe 15 different blackbirds, which are the close relatives of your American Robin, singing a full pelt, and it was intoxicating. It was so incredible to hear all these birds singing at once. It felt like they were in the jungle, but obviously you weren't. It was absolutely amazing. So that's what I do for a living. I go out and try and engage with people, and that's what brought me uh, eventually to Cleveland last year to try and meet with you guys and to talk about the idea of urban birding and getting people out to engage with their environment within the city. So this talk today, um, it's a very basic one and I'm not going to try and teach you anything about American birds because you probably know more than I do, but it's more about the philosophy and the idea of it, the whole idea of urban birding. So what is urban birding? People often ask me that, especially, well, even now, but certainly when I first started talking about it. Urban birding's actually been around as long as we've been around, basically, in urban areas. I think initially, urban birders were with guns and shooting them. But I think people have always noticed birds in urban areas, but it's always been up until very recently, seen as the poor cousin, the poor cousin to proper birding in the commas, which is going out to a refuge or somewhere remote for the weekend.
But what people fail to see, and are now just seeing, is the fact that many of the birds you get in those refuges also have turned up in urban areas. And to give you a kind of uh, an example of that, in the UK, we've recorded since you know the beginning of time in terms of recording, um, you know, the species that have turned up, which has been about 120 years now. Um, they've recorded 620 different species, um, and of those species, roughly 95% have turned up in urban areas. Even seabirds, like shearwaters and mures, I mean, I remember, I remember even seeing a, a, two puffins on the River Thames in central London one winter. So, you know, anything can turn up anywhere at any time, and that's one of the mantras of urban birding. Never think to yourself that it's only about pigeons and sparrows. There's a lot to be seen and you, you need to expect to see everything. Leave your homes thinking you see everything and nothing. You know, keep your, your mind completely open to the idea of seeing species that you would never have thought about previously to be in an urban area. And that's what I love about urban birding because I love the excitement of going out every day and knowing that I'm going to be seeing something interesting. It may not necessarily be new, it might be a species I see all the time, but it might be doing something that I've never seen it do before. And that is, for me, one of the, the specialities, one of the beauties of actually birding generally. You just never know what you're going to see. So I spend a lot of time taking people in different cities around the world, around their own neighbourhoods, like I did in Cleveland, this particular image is when I was in um, Berlin, in Germany, and I was doing a, a book launch, because I've got a book in Germany called Hashtag Urban Birding, and uh, these people, random people, showed up to the book launch, and then I took them out for a walk, and we saw so much. But urban birding, for me, is about a spiritual experience, in a way. It's about being able to open your mind and connect to nature. And it's not about trying to recognise every species you see initially. It's about being able to know that those species are there. It's about being able to go to a local park when you have never been birding before or you know, never really thought about nature. Having your lunch or just sitting down and trying to blot out the sounds, the human sounds around you, the cars, the, the, the police cars, the, the people shouting after their dogs and their kids. Try and blot those sounds out and after a period of time you start hearing nature. And that's the beauty, you start hearing nature and you see things. I love this image, for example, um, it was taken by a birder who was in Hyde Park in London and he saw this guy take his camera and just take a picture of this black-headed girl. The guy wasn't a birder at all, but he connected because he suddenly saw nature around him, unlike the guy in front. So it's really a very spiritual thing as far as I'm concerned, to be able to open your mind to this thing. And urban birding's really... Leroy. <laughs> I can hear people talking, actually. Have you all got your mics off? Yeah, but anyway, um, urban birding's really taken off. I remember when I started watching birds as a kid. You know, I was inadvertently a, an, a, an urban birder because I was told all the time that birds are to be found in the countryside, but I had no one to take me there. So in the end, I just started watching birds in my urban environment, and it was really quite fascinating to see the species that I just dreamt of being in, in the countryside actually right in my garden sometimes. So now it's not uncommon to find people in Britain certainly walking around with binoculars and looking for birds. Um, in Europe it's slightly less advanced as the UK in terms of the urban birding thing in many places. So you may sometimes get looked at in a funny way if you're walking down the street in Serbia, you know, in Belgrade with your binoculars. 
but I like to think that it will be the case that one day, very soon, it will be the done thing because most of us live in urban areas. By I think 20 to 2050, 75 percent, maybe even 80 percent, the world's population will be living in cities. So it's really important that we really just get connected because at the end of the day, everywhere you look, there are birds. And that's, as I said before, the fantastic thing about it. Everywhere you look, there are birds. This, by the way, um, is a European bird. I, just, I, just haven't, I didn't have a, a good picture of a North American bird in the same sort of situation. It's, uh, it's called a wind chat. And it's, uh, well, it's related to the old world flycatchers. Not your flycatchers, but the old world flycatchers. But what I love is that, you know, this is an urban park right in the heart of the city. And there is this bird. In fact, it's actually a migrant. It's, um, it's been migrating from Africa. And it took time to stop off in this city. This is actually a city in Latvia, Riga, to, uh, to feed up. And I just saw it. I thought it was a great advertisement for how easy it is to see birds and also the fact that you can actually see some really interesting things if you really open your eyes and start looking. So that, in effect, is what birding is for me. It's about being aware of the fact that there's nature in your immediate vicinity. So at this point, I just wondered if anyone had any questions, because this is my uh, the first section done. I want to thank you that, but there isn't any. Okay. Then I shall continue. Oh, I have a question. Oh, do you? Yeah. Um, and it's about the photograph of you uh, lying on the sidewalk and looking up. And yeah. I'm just curious about the responses that you got during that moment. That's really funny because it's like if you walk down a street naked, many people will try not to look at you. They'll just walk past as if you're not there. A few may look at you and give you quizzical looks, but no one will actually stop and ask you what you're doing. And that was what happened now. I was lying on the pavement. And the guy in the stripy top was looking up, which is really funny. But all the other people, I was there for maybe 10 minutes, just walked straight past as if they didn't even see me. So it's really quite funny how humans are. We sometimes, even though we see something, we pretend not to, because especially if we don't understand what's happening, we'd rather not even think about it, just keep on walking. So, uh, yeah, that, that was uh, the story behind that shot. That shot was taken in Notting Hill. Of, uh, yeah, obviously, you've seen the film. That's Notting Hill uh, in London, West London. And I used to live there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so, let's move on to urban landscapes. Well, basically, they are very different landscapes around in the world, in the natural world, very different habitats, ranging from rivers, through to forests, through to deserts, you know, through to scrublands, savannas. But what's interesting about urban habitats is that you can often find all of those things but within the framework of concrete. And I think I've been to maybe 350 different um, cities and towns in the world in the last 15 years and they all seem to have the same blueprint, most of them and that is there's normally a river that runs through the centre of them and they usually have large parks and small parks and pocket parks but what's interesting is despite the fact that there's lots of concrete you have to try and see these habitats or see the city you live in as how a bird would see it 
And when you start thinking along those lines, you actually start seeing more birds. Uh, to, to, to explain what I mean, I mean, just imagine if that park was in Cleveland, then a bird, especially a migrant flying overnight, will see this expanse of green and just dive down to take shelter for the, you know, for the morning to feed up. To that bird, this is a scattered woodland. To us, it's a park, but to the bird, it's a scattered woodland. And the water, work, the water will courses as well are magnets, especially when there's nothing else around in this concrete desert. And I've found in my life, for example, that you know you go to some cities and there is just one block of woodland or one block of scrub in a whole expanse of concrete. Yet, if you stand by that block of con of um, you know habitat, you will find the birds that would normally be found in the greater, you know, countryside, in bigger expanses of the same habitat, but in that tiny habitat. And another example I'll give you um, is actually from England, when I was um, birding in my local patch, which is in uh, West London, called, called Worm and Scrubs. And um, I was with the editor of a magazine, bird watching magazine, and we were walking along together, and there was one single clump of gorse. Now, gorse is a type of wild bush that occurs in the sort of wild areas of the UK. It's green with yellow flowers, and it's a very specific type of habitat for certain birds, including one species which is quite scarce in the UK called the Dartford warbler. And the Dartford warbler is gorgeous. It's kind of ruby red, reddish sort of dark reddish, with a bluish tail, a longish tail, it's a small warbler. And I remember walking past this bush and I said to him, the editor, I said, you never know, there could be a dark warbler in that bush, and there was only just the one bush, you know, and normally it's expansion of this bush everywhere, but in, in, the, in certain areas of Britain, but in, I was in London, there was one patch of the, this particular bush, and I remember saying what I said, we stood and looked at the bush, and then the bush moved, and then out of the bush popped a Dartford warbler. The editor of the magazine nearly fainted. I said to him, this is the force. And he said, I can't believe it, this is a new species to me, this is a lifer. It saves me, you know, going to a place, you know, somewhere else to look for them all day. There was one way in front of me. So basically, even if the habitat is really small, still look at it as if, you know, certain birds attached to that particular habitat could be there. Because you never know, you might be surprised and you'll find the birds that you might <laughs> have never thought would be there. So cities offer quite an interesting range of habitats, very restricted sometimes, but even so, there's still habitat there. And there's other cities around the world that are very green and very wooded, whereas there's others that are very, very concreted, but they still have, all of them have some kind of attraction to birds. And even the ones with concrete, I mean, if you look at buildings, as you look up, number one, you notice great architecture, or maybe crap architecture most of the time, actually. But if you imagine that the, uh, the buildings are like cliffs, they actually act as surrogate cliffs for a lot of birds, birds like peregrines, and even pigeons, I mean, they use them with the, the buildings because their natal habitat was cliffs, so for them it's, it's the same thing, it's just man-made. And then on the streets itself, and of course I didn't manage to take any good shots of the streets of Cleveland, but you know your streets, so I thought I'd give you something a bit more exotic for you, this is in London. But even in the streets where, you know, you've got tenement blocks and you've got, you know, limited amounts of green, there's still things to be seen. I mean, okay, there's bird art, but there's also things to be seen. And I never, when I'm in that situation, when I'm in a city and it's even, you know, like downtown, I never think to myself, I'm not going to see anything. 
because you know stranger things have happened. I've seen many interesting speeches in the heart of places that you never expect anything to be. So always keep your mind open to the idea and the thought that you'll see birds. So think about the city as a, a different type of habitat, no matter how small or even polluted sometimes. There's still habitats that can attract species. And one of the best habitats you can actually create is in your own yard, if you have one. Now this yard is a European yard, well London, British yard, so I'm not sure if the gardens in uh, Cleveland are like this, but you can create areas for wildlife if you let part of your garden grow wild to attract insects and other invertebrates that in turn will attract birds into your garden. And obviously putting out bird feeders is a, is a great way of getting to know the local bird population because they'll come into your garden and your garden will become a haven and a habitat for them at the same time. So it's all about, when you're in a city, learning about the types of habitats you have available to you, walking around and trying to sort of equate what you see to what's out in the actual wider world. So for example, you know, if you've got a lake nearby, that's a good habitat. If you've got a wood nearby, even if it's surrounded by housing, it's still a, a habitat you can think about because all these elements can build up into the next phase which is actually working out where your local patch is. So that's where I'm at now. Any questions? No? Oh. Hi, this is Leslie. Um, I, I, you, you kind of answered a question I was going to ask at the first break. Is there a difference between urban birding and and feeding birds in your backyard and creating? A, we we have something like the photo you just showed, not quite as lovely, but um, little tiny postage stamp backyard, and you know we feed the birds. Do you consider them two different things? Or is it all sort of urban birding? We live in a, a pretty urban area of Cleveland. For me, it's all urban birding. I mean, you can, you can sub-categorize it garden birding, but it's the same thing. It's all urban birding. And to be honest with you, urban birding is birding in cities and towns and, you know, places where human habitation is. But at the end of the day, for me, right. there's no difference between that and watching birds anywhere else in the world. You know, it's just that... When I started trying to push that whole urban birding concept 15 years ago, my thought was to try and get more people involved in nature. And I was thinking of a catchy way of doing it. And I thought, urban birding, <laughs> if I sold it to the media, like doing yoga, Pilates, you know, it's, it's just another sort of lifestyle choice, then it will make it more palatable. And that's what happened. You know, over the years, That's great. the media have jumped all over it. Um, I've had articles written. I mean, one person wrote an article saying, urban burning is a new ornithological rock and roll. You know, it's just <laughs> a great way of getting people engaged without That's them thinking, great. I need to know about birds or I need to be an expert. You don't. You know, anyone can do it. So that's the whole thought. And for me, it's very exciting because it's great when you get people come back to you and say, I've seen this in my garden, I saw that in my garden, in my yard. And they may not recognize what they've seen, but at least they've seen things, which is the most important thing. Right. I think it's brilliant. I do. I have one other question, and yeah. that is, and maybe you're about to address it, so just say next. Um, so we have this little tiny thing you know, tiny backyard, and we're all back to back to back, you know, all of our, how do, I'm always amazed that the birds can find our bird feeder, and our little, you know, we have a little fountain thing, a solar fountain, how do they find that? But I think you're about to talk about that, so I'm going to mute myself now. Well, actually, yeah, I'm not, I wasn't, but I will. 
Um, um, because, you know, I could talk all night about the whole whole thing, actually, but basically, birds have circuits, and they circuit an area, especially when it's young, you know, when, when birds fledge, young birds fledge, and they start exploring cool. their neighbourhood, they move around in the circuit to get to learn where's what in their in their neighbourhood, and that's how they discover the fact you've got feeders. And, you know, when the time comes, they re they'll remember when they are, you know, when it's snowing and stuff, they'll remember, ah, oh, there's a source of food. You right. know, and I'll go there to check it out. So that's basically how they get to know. They, they just know their neighbourhood like we should. Yes. Yes. Like we should. They're so smart, and we should. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so... The natural progression from understanding your sort of neighbourhood in terms of the types of habitats that are contained within walking distance of your house, for example, or where you work, is to find a local area that you can study. Um, I think a local patch is a really rewarding um, pastime if you go birding in one place local to you because you get to know the characters within that area. Now that patch could be somewhere like a local park next to where you work or you live. It could even be your yard. You know, you don't have to go anywhere even. Just look out your window. But over a period of time, if you especially if you if you walk a certain route the whole time, you get to know the, the birds, the species of birds to be found in each part of your your local patch because there'll be different habitats. So you might have a patch of woodlands, you might have a, a small lake, you know, there might be some grassland, like, you know, plain fields, soccer fields, or American football fields, whatever. You, you, you have different areas that will have different characteristics, and within those different areas will be different birds to be seen. And I think the fun thing is, when you start walking around your local patch, and you discover, you know, areas that, you know, certain species, like you might have an area where there's American robins and, um, you know, catbirds might nest, and then somewhere else there might be a, a red-tailed hawk nesting. You might have chimney swifts flying overhead during the summer, purple martins. You know, you, you get to know your patch, and the great thing is the day when you walk into your patch and you find something that you don't recognise, because for me, it's all about getting to know your common birds. I spent 15 years of my life, the first 15 years, just watching common birds. Because once you start doing that, the moment something different turns up, you know instantly it's different. Because a lot of the things you learn from watching common birds are instinctive. You know, you can't... And they're not written down, it's just that you instinctively realise that that's a starling. You instinctively realise you're hearing a, a northern cardinal or a mockingbird because it's repetition, but it's done in a very pleasurable way. It's not you know, prescriptive, it's actually very uh, organic. And the local patch will really give you that. I mean, from my point of view, this is my local patch in West London, Wormwood Scrubs. I love this place. And I love it probably more than anywhere else in the world. It's surrounded by humanity. It's in the middle of West London. It's soccer fields, but there's also some woodlands around the edge of it and the area of grassland. It's quite disturbed by people walking their dogs and stuff. I've been going here for 25 years, and when I first started going, you know, I found a whole range of species, and it was fine. And then... Bit by bit, I was seeing new birds all the time. And some of these birds were very common, just like the first time I've seen them on my patch. This patch has no water at all. Yet I was seeing shorebirds. Shorebirds, you know, shorebirds. It's incredible. It just makes, it makes you realise that these birds actually occur in, in a much wider sense. It's just like we don't look for them in the unobvious places. You know, I've had kingfishers here on a patch with no water. I've even seen uh, Eurasian bittern flying over. So over the course of 25 years or so, I managed to see um, 150 different species here. 
some of them were rarities for London. Others were actually national rarities. But a lot of them were common species which I loved watching and studying equally because there's nothing that beats your own local parish. You, know, you can go away birding and have a, a weekend away somewhere, but it's lovely to come back home to your local parish to see what's been happening. And I find it very rewarding to actually connect with a, a local area because over a period of time, you may not want to, like I didn't at first, but you start falling in love. And you realise that once your patch is threatened, because urban patches are very fragile, there's always someone wanting to develop or to change it in some way. So you get very emotionally attached. And I found myself being totally attached and very quick to defend my local patch to make sure that it's kept safe for the wildlife that's found in it. And also that people come to enjoy it as well. So that's one of the, the beauties of a local patch, which is not actually connected to birds as such, more about your connection to your grounding to the nature and the, the environment and the vibe to be found on the patch. So that's very briefly my view on local patches. I think they're very important to have and it's, it's just great to, and also the whole, the whole idea of a local patch is that you're adding to knowledge because often a local patch is not something that's on the beaten track. It's somewhere that's even in the middle of the city, but you might find that there are species of birds that come through there that people haven't realised were doing that. So one example, I've got friends um, who birds in New York. She birds in the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, everyone goes to Central Park. She goes to Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is a tiny park. Yet yeah, she's seeing tons of warblers, sparrows. You know, she gets common loon. You know, she gets all sorts of birds, some of them totally unexpected. So it shows that the migration, for example, is far broader than just one place. And it shows that maybe there's species nesting in your patch that people didn't realize were nesting and they could have been a scarce species. So it's very important, actually. It adds to our knowledge of the, uh, the bird life and other wildlife in our region. So that's the, that's the beauty for me of a local patch. Um, any uh, questions about that? I have yeah. a question, David, uh, for you. Um, hi, how, hi, hi. How big would you say your local patch is? I mean, is it, do you, do you walk? around it? Do you get in a car to go to a certain part of it? Just how long, how big do you see your local patches being? It's, um, technically it's 182 acres. Um, to walk from one side to the other, it will take you about 20 minutes. Okay. To do, to walk around birding, it, it can take me upwards of four hours. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I just go to the western end of the patch and spend an hour and a half. So a patch you can spend as much or as little time as, as you want. And also you can devise different types of walks. I mean, I've got a walk that takes me all the way around the whole site. And also I've got a second walk, which is just half the site. You know, so you can, you can actually gauge it whatever way you wish. There's no rules but you soon find that there's certain parts of your patch which are more productive than other parts of my of your patch. So, for example, in Spain, I'm in the, uh, a city called Merida, which is um, in the region called Extremadura, which is between Madrid and Seville, so it's in the southwest of all of Portugal. And there's a reservoir near where I live, where I am, and mm -hmm. I noticed that one part of the reservoir it's really quite wild. You go to the other side of the reservoir, there's open air restaurants, there's people fishing. It's very disturbed. Despite that, I found a pair of uh, long-eared owls nesting right next to the restaurant. But anyway, 
you get more uh, on, on the wilder side than you do on, on the side that's populated by people. But that's fairly obvious, I suppose. But even so, it's still worth checking. Hence, climbing the, the long eight hours. I actually heard them um, three nights ago. I drove past at night and I heard the, the young birds squeaking right next to my window of the car. It's amazing. Beautiful. Huh. David. David, can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm Wendy, and I'm actually a former Clevelander, but I live in New Orleans, and I have lived in New Orleans for 35 years, but I bird in Cleveland whenever I, in fact, I participated in one of the WCAS bird counts. But um, I, one thing I just, it's not a question, I just wanted to comment on, and I think you'll agree with me, that um, one of the things this COVID thing has done is that it has forced us to stay in our backyard and study these common birds much more closely and not, you know, just write them off, oh, that's a, a white-eyed vireo. So, for example, this spring I've been studying all of the different uh, vocalizations of white-eyed vireos, and I didn't even know they had that many. And that's really been something I wouldn't have done if COVID allowed me to go wherever I wanted to go. That's all I no. wanted to say. <laughs> no, that's a great that's a great thing to say, Wendy, because I've noticed the same here in Spain. I go on top of my my sun terrace, and there's spotless starlings, which are a different species to the starlings, European starlings you have. They're only found in Spain and parts of Italy, but they look similar, but slightly bigger with no spots or no no blotches on them. But they still have a song that's very mimic, filled with you know imitations of other birds. And there's one that does an imi uh, it imitates a heron and a partridge perfectly. <laughs> and I got to know that particular bird. I've watched it over the weeks. I watched it singing on top of a, uh, a pylon. I watched it find its mate. I watched it having sex. <laughs> I watched it um, now feeding young. So you see the whole life cycle, which you'd never see. You know, if you were just casually going up every now and again and not staying around the same place all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, this section now is going to be very quick because you guys know what you're doing, or well, what you do anyway, in terms of what birds to look for. But for me, it's 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 about because when I come to Cleveland, although my working knowledge of US US birds or northern American North American birds is is not bad. I am not familiar. So I'm, you know, the Mockingbird song, for example, um, you guys will know instantly I have to work at it. But for me, I see shapes, and often when you see a bird, it's like this, it's like distant and not necessarily recognizable straight away. So it's about, I think, getting to know getting to know your terrain, getting to know the sorts of birds to to expect. And I think also people often ask, how do you recognise birds? How do you know how do you know that's a starling? How do you know that's a you know a pinnated woodpecker? I think it's about I always say to people it's it's like walking down the street and you hear someone call your name and before you even turn to look you know it's John. And when you look to confirm that it's John you see that his shape, his clothes, his facial look tells you that that's John. And it's the same with birds. I think it's like recognising faces. You just after a while, you unconsciously start recognising faces. Now, I like showing this, this slide to the because even though it's actually directed to a British audience, you kind of start picking out things just by a slight part of their jizz, their, their general view, you know. So the top left, you see my arrow? Can you see that? I can't, I don't know if you can, but my arrow is on uh, Anjali Jali's lips. And then yes. I see, okay, you just glance and you know straight away that's Batman. I don't know who that is. And then you got, you got Prince. You've got Gordon Ramsay, you've got David Beckham, you've got Marilyn Monroe, and this is a British guy, Bill Oddie. But it's amazing how you can recognise 
things unconsciously just by seeing a slight part of them because you get to know the characteristics and mannerisms. So basically, rec recognizing birds is all about, not, not necessarily about the plumage detail, but it's about the whole way the bird behaves and also where you see it and also what time of year and how you see it. So it's quite an interesting subject. Most people starting out birding will be looking at these guys and they're the truly urban bird in the, in the world and after the chicken they have the distinction of being the longest domesticated by man. These are of course feral pigeons whose descendants, um, the rock doves, as their name suggests, spend a lot of time um, in cliffs. And these guys were, you know, domesticated by man, used as food, and then let loose in our cities, and then vilified. And basically they are victims of power excess. You know, it's not their fault, but they are how they are. It's just that we introduced them, it's our fault. And another classic bird, of course, is the, the house sparrow. I like to make an appeal to round up all the house sparrows in America and bring them back to the UK and Europe because we are sorely missing them. In the UK, the house sparrow has diminished by 80% over the last 25 years, which is really, really sad. I mean, when I grew up, they were all over the place. And now um, there's only maybe four places in central London where you can see them. It's really sad how they have actually diminished the number. And of course, other birds to look for when you're walking around your patch in Cleveland. I mean, there could be loads. You know, you probably know, you actually know much more than I do. One of my favourite is the American Robin, which should really be called the brick bellied, brick coloured, or the red bellied thrush or something, because it's much, much better name for me, actually. But anyway, beautiful bird. I, I always loved red, um, American Robins. And um, it's very exciting when an American robin makes it over this side of the pond. There's usually maybe one record a year from the UK and not often sticking around either. I remember once that um, someone made a, a, a contacted a bird, I could say, but had seen a weird bird in their garden in Peckham in South London and they'd been there for two weeks over Christmas. And of course, when the bird has showed up, it's gone. But the pictures that the household owner took was clearly that of a, an American robin. Yeah, I mean, I, I've just put a few token birds there, but you know, you, you're getting a lot of stuff through at the moment because I've been watching most of my feed is from Cleveland on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> and so I, I, I've been keeping tabs on all the, the warblers coming through and people finding sparrows and stuff. Um, the starling is another bird that I suppose is a bit of a pest uh, where you are, but we'd like them back because they're another species uh, in Europe that's really diminishing in number. They're quite pretty birds, but I understand they are pests over in North America. And another bird that I love seeing um, when I came to Cleveland, um, the Lindville Gull. I understand that they've really expanded in number over the last 35, 40 years and we were sort of regularly seeing them on the British side of the Atlantic as well. They were annual in Ireland and parts of Britain. One or two, not flocks, just one or two. But apparently that number has now fallen away. They've become quite rare for some reason because they were actually touted as being uh, a colonist, a future colonist, because I think they may have even bred in the Azores, which is basically halfway between you and, and the, the old world. And another classic bird of the urban area um, is the peregrine, a real survivor. They've really taken to the, you know, the idea of urban life um, to the full, because obviously their main prey, which is the pigeon, is, is very, very prevalent in urban areas, so they're doing very well. So, I mean, that's a handful of birds. I'm sure you can tell me a lot more. And, I, you know, this section was actually, it wasn't in any way designed to, to be telling you what birds to look for, because you obviously know much more than I do. So, uh, I think the next thing to talk about is how do you see them? Um, does anyone want to ask any questions about 
the, uh, the birds to be expected. Who's been seeing anything interesting? Um, hi, I'm curious about the your favorite bird that you've seen in lockdown in Spain. Um, I think. Can you see this? Good. Well, I think the birds that I love watching um, when they fly over is the Eurasian black vulture, which is very different to your black vulture. This picture doesn't really do it justice, as long as you can see it. It's at the bottom of the page. Is the uh, is it? Yes, I can. Okay. It's the largest um, bird of prey in Europe with a wingspan of around about nine feet. So it's bigger than anything you've got as well, apart from the California condor. And uh, in Extremadura, in Spain, where I am now, I mean, the, the, the distribution is from Spain all the way over to Mon Mongolia, but in pockets, it's not common anywhere apart from here. In Extremadura, there are maybe 900 pairs. It's the biggest single population in the world with this particular bird. And it's amazing when I look up from my urban sun terrace and see them drifting overhead. It's just, it just sends tingles down my spine, really, because to, to think for that bird, a majestic bird, is so rare globally. Um, and also to think that, you know, it's, it's a scavenger. And I often wonder where they find all the food. But as I said earlier, extra is the size of Kentucky. And there's only one million people in the whole region. So it's not heavily populated. And there's lots of people farming with sheep. So when the sheep die, before the farmer can find it, the vultures have already eaten it. So that's how they survive. So I think that must be my favorite bird in Spain during lockdown. Good. Um, I have a okay. question. Sure. Since we've been in lockdown, my backyard has brought birds that usually I don't see in my neighborhood. I live close to the lake, so that's always a good spot to go see birds. But I've had cowbirds this year. I have some baby bluebirds, which is a, a first for me this year. And earlier I had a lot of juncos and finches, orioles, and a few weeks ago um, it had kind of gotten cool and lots of warblers, like burning warblers, were in the trees in my neighborhood. And it's not a, um, you know, it's just a small residential area. But I think because of the lake, there's lots of birds that are moving through. And I also think that this lockdown has created a different pattern that birds are using trees that they wouldn't normally use because they are in residential areas. Instead of just heading straight to the lake, they're stopping and feeding off of some of the trees and foliage that's uh, close to the lake, but not right at the lake. So I've had a really wonderful time. That's fantastic. I think you're right. I think... I've, um, I've noticed certainly in Europe that many species are actually nesting in areas that they wouldn't have nested before because there's no people around or less people. But they've found new territories. My worry, though, was uh, especially in America where the beaches were shut for a while. So I worried for the shorebirds and the terns that suddenly turned up and found, found these expanses of sand and thought, great. And new territory, let's go breed. And then all of a sudden, a stampede of people came during the course of them raising young. I just hope they managed to get their broods off. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, birds recognized that there were places they can, they can come back into. But it shows you how quickly nature takes over. You know, we are gone for like two months and already things change. So if we were gone completely, nature would take over in five minutes. 
It's really incredible. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we go on to the subject of how we watch them. Well, the most classic thing is through binoculars. Um, I always suggest that when you buy binoculars, you don't buy them from the internet without trying them, or you don't buy them from a magazine. Would you buy a car off the internet or on a magazine? Go and give it a test drive. So I think if you, if you get binoculars, give them a test drive because you know you need to feel how they are in your hands and if they fit your face because there's so many different types of binocular. And also it's worth just looking through several different types, you know, talking to your friends and see what, 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 what binoculars they use and see if they suit you. Um, the other thing is that people often pick up binoculars thinking they can use them immediately, like you do in the films, like the James Bond films and they got the inverted figure of eight. You know, people think you should be looking and seeing that inverted figure of eight. Well, you shouldn't. It should be one whole image. And also, you need to make sure that the lenses, each barrel, um, is fixed for your eyes. So, basically speaking, looking at this image now, you look through one lens, the one on your right, one without any um, uh, striations or lines on the uh, on the actual um, lens, and you focus using the central barrel on one object with the other eye closed, and then you swap eyes, look through the other eye, and focus using the, the barrel on the actual lens itself until you can see perfectly. And then that's when you know the, the binoculars have actually been set out for your eyes, because everyone's eyes are different. We usually tend to have one eye that's dominant. Mine is my right eye. So make sure that you can offer the set up properly and then you can be uh, off and away. I don't necessarily believe you need to have a telescope first thing. I think telescopes come later. Um, often when I'm urban birding, I never use telescopes. I just use my camera, my got camera, and certainly my binoculars. And in terms of attire, um, when you're urban birding, the beauty is you can wear whatever you want. You know, you don't necessarily have to go through the same field craft you would do if you were in the middle of a, you know, a refuge, because usually the birds in urban areas are far more used to humans than they are outside, which means that you can approach them probably a lot closer than you would do if you were in the, in the a rural area. That said, I did see this lady in Taiwan, and I was thinking, you know, you, you, you're not, not going to get anywhere near any birds wearing that bright pink jacket and the camo just doesn't work. <laughs> I don't think the, uh, the stylist was doing a good job that day. Um, I came to the Catskills Mountains once and I didn't wear the classic um, green. I bought a lot of stuff that was all one-off. I wore two or three different jackets. A hat I bought in a store in London. I borrowed the face thing. I was freezing, but I still look cool. The great thing about urban birding is you can always run into a, a Starbucks, which you can't do when you're out in the fields. You could possibly want to. You can. You may want to aim to have this look, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. So fashion is totally up to you. I really believe that we should try and push the boundaries a bit so that people who have this stereotypical view of birders get surprised when they realise that you can actually wear whatever you want. So that's um, how to look for them very, very briefly and how to and what to wear whilst looking for them. I'm going to move on to note taking. Any questions by the way? Okay. Very quickly, note taking um, is a, I think, a bit of an old art, old fashioned art now, really. Um, I used to take notes all the time using a pen and paper. Um, nowadays, people use their mobile phones, um, they can speak into them, make recordings. I mean, I like watching birds and I see something that I don't understand in terms of its ID. 
that I can speak into my phone and describe it as I watch it, which is a benefit to then having to write it down whilst you're looking, because if you look down and start writing, the bird might disappear. So it's very, I think it's very good to use modern technology to try and identify birds. Also, if you've got a camera, take a few snaps, but why not flick it onto video and see if you can take a video shot as well, because sometimes you can catch some nuances of a particular species which can actually really help you to identify it, which is probably better than just some flat photographs. So maybe try and slip on your video camera. I always say to people, if you've got a camera, take the lens cap off. The lens cap should be nowhere near the camera. And just take pictures, enjoy yourself. Don't worry about the lighting or anything. Just take pictures, enjoy it. Because they're your pictures. You know, you don't have to show them anywhere if you don't want to. I mean, I some of my favourite pictures are blurred. I love them. Um, an important element of uh, urban birding, I think, in fact, birding generally, is to have a field guide. Um, this is one of my favourite North American field guides. Um, the thing, we, thing is with field guides is that people sometimes use them like Bibles and think, it, think to themselves the bird's going to look exactly like the bird in the book. But in reality, you should use a field guide as what it was actually intended to be for. It's a guide, nothing more. No guide can actually show every single plumage that you expect to see in, in, in the wild. It's just a general guide. But I like the fact that guides have a history, um, just very briefly. Um, the first guide was published, the first bird guide was published in 1544 by a guy called William Turner, who was a scholar and a, and a clergyman in England. And he was dubbed the father of British ornithology. And the title uh, actually wasn't very short, it's called a short and succinct history of the principal birds noticed by Pliny and Aristotle. That was a very catchy headline, very catchy title. But it was written in Latin, and that book actually launched a thousand ships. And then later on, uh, there's a guy uh, called Thomas Buick, um, who was a woodgraver and naturalist, and he produced uh, a book. Um, well, actually, two books about the birds of Britain, and um, the language was quite interesting because in those days it's all about you may see the wimble sh shifting its quarters in the night sky. Very, very flamboyant language. But the first proper modern field guide appeared in 1934, and it was born in the USA to call to coin um, Bruce Springsteen. Um, it was courtesy of an ornithologist and artist an all-round legend called Roger Tory Peterson. Um, and his idea was basically to, to produce a book that had species that looked similar to each other, having arrows or lines pointed to the salient parts of the bird that you know, be differentiated from, from the other species. So he was the father of the modern day field guide. And now there's a plethora of field guides. You know, you've got field guides to regions like this one. You've got field guides to um, to tiny regions like the, you know sub regions. You've got field guides to, to bird families. You know, and they cover all sorts of bird expertise. So I don't leave home without a field guide. I think no matter how expert you are, there's nothing. There's no shame in having a field guide because no one knows everything and everyone makes mistakes. And the more mistakes you make, the better you are. So never be afraid to make mistakes. Never be, never be afraid to ask questions. And always when you are confronted with a bird you don't recognize and someone tells you it's a blah, 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 you know, it's a, you know, a, 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 an older flycatcher, ask yourself the question, why is it an older flycatcher? And would I recognize it if I saw it on my own? So maybe even ask, if you don't mind, tell me why it is what it is. And that's how you learn. So that's that section done. Um, any questions? Hey, it's Leslie again. Um, hi again. 
I, Nancy, I think, I'm not sure if you said it in the beginning or, and or David, um, how do you, how do you use your binoculars with your camera? Somebody brought that up. Yeah. Did um, I make that up? No, someone did, yeah. You can, you can actually get, um, these things, um, I've lost the word for them, but you can actually hook it onto your, your binocular lens. It's like a camera holder, camera thing that goes onto your, um, onto your phone. I mean, some people, I've seen some people actually line it up manually and take pictures. I mean, that's bloody difficult, but you can, I was, yeah. by, you can buy a contraption that then sort of hooks onto your lens of your binocular, and then your camera's ready to go, your phone's ready to go. Um, most people do it on their, using their camera, a phone camera on their telescope, and that's called right. uh, phone scoping. I have to look into that. Thank you. I, I didn't even, I didn't even have that advantage. I, I don't have that little doohickey that attaches to the phone or the the, the binoculars. So I'm like, I'm like, you know, my hands are shaking, and I'm trying to get the lens, and the and I snapped a couple of snaps. So um, I propped myself up against the fence. I'm like, ah, I got to get this picture. So yeah. You should have seen me. Yeah, my neighbors probably thought thought I was nuts. Of but course, okay. good, yeah. good for them. And I was, I was I was wearing pink and camouflage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm sure you look good though. So yeah, so bin scoping and phone scoping. Are Thank two you. Of the modern sort of ways of capturing birds now. Um, the final thing I want to talk about very, very briefly is once you've started birding, it's so nice to hang out with people, like-minded people. And that's what I noticed when I came to Cleveland and I was with members of WCAS at various different locations every day. It's like, you know, being part of a family and you can learn from each other. It's just really great um, when you're all together and you're finding birds and there's someone who actually explains why or whatever it is is what it is. And it's also nice to get the, the backstory as well, which I, I love backstories. I love knowing a bit more about the bird. Where does it come from? Where, you know, where, where does it spend the, the winter? You know, what does it feed on? Does it breed here? What's it doing here? You know, those sort of questions are great. And, and when you see good birds, everyone's celebrating. It's a fantastic, fantastic feeling. Um, I love birding. I love most of the people in the birding world that I come across. I love the people I've met in Cleveland. They're my, they're my family. And I've loved being with you guys tonight. And I hope that this very brief view on urban birding has been of some help. Um, as I said earlier, I was going to be in Cleveland next week. But, you know pandemic, the, the pandemic dictated otherwise, but I'm looking forward to when that doesn't happen again and I can come out and have to spend some real quality time with you guys. So I'd like to thank you for spending your time and listening to, listen to me tonight. And obviously if you've got any more questions, please feel free. But thank you very much for your time and I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much, David. I, I'm, there may be another couple questions, um, but we appreciate your, your, you are family to us, and we want you back um, no matter what season, because um, you know we just, we just had a blast when you were in town. So um, yeah, again, any, any further questions? I see a couple things in the chat. I don't know if that's just people saying thank you. Oh, yep, people are wishing you well for your Achilles. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> David. It's not a question that I think you might like about urban birding. Um, I don't know. You've been in New York. I don't know if you've ever been to um, uh, to Jamaica Bay. Yes, I have. Yeah, I love it there. Well, so you know, you you, you take the subway out. Yeah. You take the, the, the subway out to the island and um, and you get off there. Well. Uh, on the way out, as we were getting off the uh, train, my, my wife and I um, 
this man came up to us and he was a birder and he was from uh, London. And he said, oh, you know, uh, I'm here on a conference and this is my day off and uh, I, I want to see some birds. And um, he says, there's two birds that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Maybe you can help me. I, I said, well, what, what are the two birds you want to see? Said, I want to see an American robin and I want to see cedar waxwings. And they say, well, the, the American robin, we can guarantee you. Stick with us. You'll see what American robin. Cedar waxwing, maybe. You know, you can't guarantee. And by the way, the um, American um, robin used to be called the migratory thrush. Yeah, that was the original common name, migratory thrush. And, yeah. and the scientific name is Turdus migratorius. So it's still, it's still the scientific name. So... Um, uh, we did. We did, in fact, see uh, robins, and we did, in fact, see cedar waxwings. And then he started bemoaning the loss of starlings in England. <laughs> when he, saw some starlings. And he, you know, he complains about not not being able to see starlings any longer, and, or in, in the way that he used to, you know, the flights of starlings. So it was a it was a very nice urban ur- urban moment, you know, <laughs> urban burning moment. I remember, I remember one of the first times, in fact, the first time I went to Jamaica Bay, I was, I left, I was, I was staying in Manhattan, I left <coughs> at four in the morning, because I wanted to, I was so excited, I wanted to get there for dawn, and I was on the, I think the A train, and it was frightening, because there were all these people coming back from clubs or whatever they were doing, and there's me sitting there with my telescope, and people walking past looking at me and thinking, what's he doing with that telescope? But anyway, I managed to get to Jamaica Bay safely, and it was a great, great time. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Last question for me. Do you have a new book coming out, or a new book that just came out? I missed that, or maybe I'm making that up. Well, my latest book is going to be in Alberta, but um, this summer, whilst in lockdown and whilst you know in pandemic pandemic mode, I'm writing three e-books. Um, the first one's going to be a photographic yeah, book. Um, the second one's going to be uh, a very sort of international um, guide to urban birding, and the third one, <coughs> which I'm hoping to get done by the end of the year will be The Birds of Wormwood Scrubs, 1980 to 2020. That's great. So, like a Kindle edition, that kind of, like my e-book? Like e- e-book, and also I'm going to print a few copies as well on demand. I'm going to do it myself. Plus, on top of that, I've just been given the rights for my first book, The Urban Birder, uh, to, to have that printed in Spanish. So, I'm going to get that done as well. Wow, that's a lot of work. A lot of work. There's nothing else to do. I'm sitting there in my head. (laughs) There's nothing else to do. That's so sad. But, wow. Great. Thank you. So Amy Amy Shook saw saw, Amy Shook saw her first cedar waxing yesterday. That's good. So, uh, any more questions? Oh, it doesn't look like it's like that. I'm thinking of doing another social media live on the weekend, because now I've got my bike, I can go a bit further afield. Nice. So I might do a live bird watch in my oh. in my in my, um, in my hood. That would be great. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, keep an eye out on, on social media. I'll, I'm, I'll name it then. I'll mention it then. Do you post a lot of? Do you post everything that you post on social media on your 
Urban Fur website also? No. Okay. No. The only things I put on my website currently is my series I'm doing uh, called In Conservation With. Right. When I'm talking to various people around the world about their work in conservation. Okay. Um, I think um, we've got um, a few people that you'll know coming up soon as well. Excellent. That was a really good show on Sunday. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. We have a question. What is? What are your social media accounts? On Twitter, actually, let's have a look now. On Twitter, it's um, if you look up at Urban Birder, at Urban Birder. Um, on Facebook, it's, uh, there's two. There's me, David Lindo, and then there's the Urban Birder as well. Plus. There's the Urban Birder group where you can actually add your photographs. And then I've got an Instagram, Instagram account as well, which um, I think it's just uh, if you look for um, the Urban Birder. Thanks. Wow. Well, this, this was a fantastic evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we will be seeing everybody again and and get a, getting a chance to talk with folks. But thank you. Uh, hopefully, you can join us next month uh, on uh, July seventh. And uh, good birding, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Sweet dreams. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Paula. Thanks, David. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.